Thanks for joining us for today's History at High Noon, Mary Ellen's Bird Nest, Crafting a Carolina Christmas. My name is Stacey and I handle adult education over at the museum. And we're so glad that you're joining us for today's lunchtime lecture series. Uh, History at High Noon is just one of MOH's many exciting digital offerings available through our History at Home initiative. So if you'd like to learn more, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org to learn more. Before we get started, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our North Carolina Museum of History Associates and Foundation for making today's program possible. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like today's program happen. If you'd like to learn more about becoming an Associates member, you can head over to their website at www.ncmoha.com. We would like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who graciously donated funds towards today's program as well. Uh, we do our best to keep our programming free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping these series going. And we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum and its programs. A few housekeeping tips for today. Uh, please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the event. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our speaker, please type them into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the lecture, our adult programs intern, Simone, will be asking our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. All right, so now it is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Michael Osman. Michael has worked for the North Carolina Museum of History in a variety of roles since the 1990s, but is now serving as the museum's associate curator of decorative arts. He has decorated historic sites throughout North Carolina and Virginia, including the Executive Mansion, home to our governor, Mordecai Historical Park, Dole Lane Museum House, and others with authentic to the era decorations for several years, even having his designs be featured in Colonial Homes Magazine's Christmas issue. All right, Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Stacy, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in and giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I would like to thank the museum, the associates and the foundation, as well as thanking uh, Stacy too for all of, of her helping doing this. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and hopefully I will be able to share my screen here. And get ready here. Okay, so the, the, um, the talk today is going to talk about uh, Christmas decorations um, and how we decorate uh, our homes and historic sites. And I hate to admit it, but I've not decorated yet for Christmas. Uh, and I don't know how many uh, of you have, um, but I've not decorated yet. But after giving this talk, I, I plan to do some decorating. Uh, I'm going to start you off with a little bit of entertainment. This is probably one of my most favorite Christmas movies of all time. Uh, it comes from The Homecoming, um, uh, talking about the Waltons. And it uh, has inspired me for my talk today and really for my my. Uh, career and, and decorating for Christmas. So hopefully this will work and you will be entertained. Excuse me here. Fingers crossed. Uh, sorry here, let's see what's going on. Fingers crossed, because if one bulb has gone bad, then none of them's going to work. Do you want some help, John Paul? Plug it in. I just 
Oh, what's that? It's a blood chain nest. So got an egg in it. You can't put that thing on a tree. It's full of mites. Little rotten egg will smell bad. The egg is not rotten. I blew all the stuff out of it. Inside, it's clean as a whistle. Look at it. Still got bird poop on it. What's an nasty thing like that on a Christmas tree? I do it. It's not nasty. You're such a crazy. Don't turn blue, Aaron. John, boy, look what she's done. You know, Santa Claus is going to take one look at that bird poop and he's going to head right back up the chimney. Hi, baby. Santa Claus won't come because of you. <laughs> you want to be ashamed of yourself, Miriam. Oh, you're all a bunch of pimp fans. <laughs> yourself, Mary Ellen. My bird's nest is the prettiest thing on the whole tree. What about this name, Paul? He said we were pissants. Well, you know better than that, don't you, Elizabeth? I don't feel like a pissant. Hey, you see. This bird's nest looks nice there. It looks real natural. So as you as you can see, that is that is what we're going to talk about today: the using nature in Christmas and uh, and, and keeping it real. Our our Christmas traditions are as rich and varied as our culture here in North Carolina. Uh, how we choose choose and and how we chose to celebrate and decorate is just as varied. T today we will explore how history and time have shaped our holiday celebration and decor. We will also take a look at how to interpret Christmas decor for sites while being creative with historic boundaries. Christmas to most early settlers was a time to celebrate their religious beliefs. Traditions either fulfilled a spiritual need or served a cultural purpose. For example, let's take a look at the greens beside the door frame. Greenery was considered symbolic. For instance, holly was symbolic of fertility, eternal life, uh, and the crown of thorns that was placed on top of Christ's head, and the berries symbolized the blood of Christ. Uh, evergreens were a symbol of mortality, strength, uh, and eternal life, immortality, strength, and eternal life. The ivy was symbolic of fidelity, of binding, and of vigor. Boxwood was symbolic of longevity, immortality, stature, and taste. And mistletoe was a symbol of renewal, hope, and friendship. One Norway tradition adopted by many English settlers was the placing of a Yule log in the fire on winter solstice night. The ashes from the burned log were spread throughout the house to protect the inhabitants from evil spirits. The Twelfth Night celebration dated back centuries. Twelfth Night took place the last night of the 12 days of Christmas, usually on January the 5th, marking the Epiphany. Festivities usually included merrymaking, singing Christmas carols, and attending church services. Attending parties, dancing, eating, and attending church services were the focus of most Christmas festivities to the end of the 19th century. Boughs of greens and holly may have been hung and placed in windows, but no one forgot to hang the mistletoe. In the antebellum South, some free people of color and many enslaved persons participated in the festive and raucous African and West Indian tradition of John Canoe. 
Usually on Christmas morning, participants dressed in colorful costumes, played music, sang, and danced to entertain plantation households or town folk. Afterwards, a hat was placed around for donations. And I'd like to put in a plug here uh, coming up in uh, January, we will have our African American culture celebration and you will be able to, to see a live uh, presentation of the John Canoe celebration. So make sure you tune in so you can uh, catch that. <clears throat> when Frank Prufer, a German immigrant arrived in Staunton, Virginia, in 1855, he caused quite a commotion at Christmas time. He set up probably Virginia's first Christmas tree in Staunton. It was said he attracted much curiosity. Who could have guessed that John D. Rockefeller's restoration of Colonial Williamsburg would have spawned a Christmas phenomenon almost 80 years after Frank Prufer's Christmas tree in Staunton, Virginia. How did the colonial Christmas, colonial Williamsburg Christmas style we recognize today develop? And what were the inspirations for this new style of decorating uh, that we all have come to know and, and love today. Louise Fisher was a leading figure in the Williamsburg style. When she arrived in 1930s uh, to Virginia, she arrived with her husband with one truckload of furniture and two truckloads of plants. So she was quite an, uh, a gardener and plant aficionado. And, and she was a proponent of, of decorating with the natural materials and dried flowers. Uh, and they were usually called everlastings in the 18th century. Um, and, and she began drying flowers and arranging flowers for, for taverns uh, in the, in the in the Raleigh Tavern uh, and for the governor's palace as well. And there, there was a precedence for using dry flowers in arrangements uh, in the 18th century. Uh, Peter Collinson sent John Custis of Williamsburg uh, some globe amorous seeds. And he instructed Custis if you cut the flowers and they are gathered in perfection and hung up with their head down on a dry, in a dry shady room, they will keep that close for years and will make a pleasant ornament to adorn the windows or mantle of your park or study for all winter long. So really, uh, Louise had really tapped into the uh, colonial uh, precedence of decorating with dried flowers in a person's uh, a home. Even today, we, we do question, when we go to Colonial Williamsburg, it's like, did they really use apples and pineapples and fresh fruit, uh, which was so scarce? And, and no, they didn't, um, but, uh, they're using a, a natural material, even though it wasn't a period appropriate. And even in the 1930s, uh, Louise was called out for her choice of dahlias and a bowl of grapefruit fruits uh, for decoration that she had placed on the tavern table in the Raleigh Tavern. A and a visitor commented that grapefruit and dahlias were not available to 18th century households. So this really sparked a long journey of exploration and research by Louise and the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to determine and to define a historical context 
for decorating uh, in the colonial Williamsburg style uh, of decorating. Uh, one of the inspirations uh, for the design for, for Christmas uh, and, and year-round decorating with flowers were Robert Ferber's 18th century engravings, and they provided evidence of flowers that were available to colonial consumers. And he really was the first nurseryman in uh, uh, colonial America to produce a catalog documenting 12 months of seasonal flowers. And it also included new world plants. So this was definitely a design resource that uh, would have been available to colonists, uh, showing them uh, flowers and depicting flowers um, that they could have uh, purchased uh, for their gar colonial gardens. Another um, design resource uh, came from the 15th century Florentine sculptor, Luca della Robbia, uh, and he provided historical design influence for Colonial Williamsburg's fruit laden wreaths. Uh, Luca specialized in sacred, colorful, narrative, decorative plats, pla plaques, and planners uh, with the, the fruit, garland, and, and greens. And he was praised for his humble use of clay and conveying the bountiful blessings of the Christian faith and all that it had to bestow on its believers. Period engravings and prints also provided documentation of placement and types of, of Christmas greens. And here we will see in the uh, two Christmas gambles at the top, uh, which were games and festivities and merriment uh, in the colonial era, you see in the gamble to your left, you will see it looks like sprigs of holly and greenery above the mantle. Uh, also uh, in the next uh, uh, Christmas print there, the Christmas gamble, you will see a large sprig of mistletoe hanging above the, the gentleman. Um, you'll see sprigs also on the mantle and, and other Christmas greens throughout the house. Uh, the, the Christmas in the country uh, print below, you will see uh, again uh, various Christmas greens uh, and also uh, the partaking of Christmas punch, where it looks like somebody has already had a little bit too much of punch there. These prints also inspired artists, cabinet makers, and architects who often copied or adapted design elements for their own creations. So sometimes, you will see, you know, copies of furniture, and you will see uh, paintings with um, uh, the sitter's stance in the paintings actual copied from English uh, or French prints of the period. So that way, that can help you date the style and time period of the painting if it's if it's not known. In eighteen forty one. Albert Sachs Coburg gifted the first tree to Queen Victoria. And 1848 engraving of the Queen's family around that family tree created a rage for the new Christmas fad. It wasn't until 1890, however, that the colorful blown glass ornaments became the norm to decorate uh, Christmas trees. Much like that, much like we do today. Biltmore, George and Edith Vanderbilt's 170,000, 75,000 square foot house nestled in the mountains of Western North Carolina, officially opened on December the 24th, 1895. 
their banquet hall featured a Christmas tree over 20 foot tall, complete with electric lights. At the time, fewer than 20% of US families even brought Christmas trees into their homes. And the, the gardener at Biltmore was a, a little um, disturbed. He was afraid that that Christmas tree might not have been tall enough. So he wanted to make sure that it was really large and made a presence in the banquet hall. And they actually even held competitions to see which county and which town had the best mistletoe, the best greens, and the best hollies because they wanted the, the opening night of Christmas celebrations at the Biltmore to be the best that it possibly could be. So I think that's quite interesting that, you know, local towns were vying for the best holly and best mistletoe. It was in fact, it wasn't in fact until after World War II that, that many rural North Carolina homes became electrified. So when you think back to Biltmore and, and their home was electrified and their Christmas tree had actual electric lights, that was quite a feat. Uh, but for most North Carolinians, that didn't really happen um, until after World War II. And oftentimes, even then, homes didn't have the, the store-bought ornaments. People would, would make the own ornaments out of cotton bowls, uh, dried flowers, uh, pieces of ribbon and paper. And people also would take the full wrappings uh, in cigarette containers cut them in strips and use that as, as tinsel uh, on the Christmas tree. So really making use of, of what was available at home uh, for them to decorate their, their trees with. Recently, there has been a renewed rejection of mass produced Christmas decor and a return to handcrafted uh, ornaments and decorating. Historic sites and houses are now reinterpreting their educational programming to include underrepresented persons and incorporating um, their own period holiday aesthetic to take advantage of the burgeoning Christmas tourist industry, much like Colonial uh, Williamsburg did decades ago. Did colonists decorate with scarce fresh fruit? No. Uh, did they decorate the halls with a passion uh, and fever like we do today? Uh, no. Uh, they did, however, they decorate their homes with, with local greens and, and dried flowers to appeal to their sensibilities and customs of the era. Um, they, you know, they decorated, but not the way, not the way that, not the way that we did. Uh, and one, one, it, it even, it went back as far as decorating the homes with fresh greens and flowers was documented in 1560 with Lavinius Limentus, who wrote that uh, people's bedchambers uh, and parlors were strewn over with sweet herbs and green brow, boughs, which refreshed me and entirely delighted all my senses. So here, you know, here was a visitor uh, who had visited somebody's house in 1560 and was talking about their fresh greens and dried flowers and herbs that delighted their senses. So yes, they did decorate, but not in the way that, that we do today. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg uh, did create uh, a Christmas experience that was fanciful, but it was natural and organic using materials that were natural, like uh, oranges and apples and pineapples and pine cones and dried flowers. 
uh, instead of using the mass manufactured Christmas ornaments that much of us use uh, today. And, you know, they use feathers and pine cones and branches um, and even straw uh, flowers as well. Like Mary Ellen, I strive to incorporate natural elements and native flora and fauna into my Christmas decorations I make for historic sites. I always plan my decorations according to the historic period of the site. Besides my traveling companion, which is usually my sister, my most trusted friends are my logbook used to make notes throughout the year on locations of materials. Uh, and literally I will be riding along the road and I will see a, a dried flower or a seed pod or a vine or something that I believe will, will work great in a, uh, an arrangement. And I will make note of it uh, in my diary and, and then go back during the fall and gather it um, for my decorations. Along with my diary, uh, I have my good pair of gloves and my good trusty pair of clippers. That is, that is something you definitely uh, need when you're out uh, gathering materials like that. So what I'm going to talk about now are some of the some of the decorations that that I have done um, uh, for historic sites here in North Carolina and Virginia. So I will just kind of go through some of these and, and give you pointers. Um, for most sites that I have decorated with. Um, uh, it was of the time period that that ribbons would have been too expensive to have placed in a Christmas tree. So what I did do was adapt the idea of a ribbon by by cutting up strips of of burlap and, and using it as a ribbon uh, like material. And burlap is something that people uh, would have had access to uh, during the, the 18th and 19th century that they could have used if they wanted to put something like that in, in a wreath. Uh, again, it is, the burlap is really symbolizing like ribbon, even though it's, it's a, a natural material. You will also see in this wreath here, raffia, that's a natural straw-like material that uh, probably many of you have used before. And that is something that um, I will tie uh, like a ribbon out of into the wreath. Here I have used uh, pomegranates that are from a tree in my yard. I have also used guinea feathers. So I will go to my friends who have chickens and fowl and uh, ask them for their feathers uh, out in their yard to incorporate into my wreaths. And, and in the bottom right hand part of the screen here with the wreath, uh, you will see a bunch of dried flowers and that is rabbit tobacco. Uh, and uh, I've heard old timers say down east, uh, North Carolina where I'm from, that they would actually uh, take the leaves from the rabbit tobacco and smoke it. Uh, I've not tried that, um, but I do use the, the flowers uh, from the rabbit tobacco uh, as a filler in Christmas greens. And as you can see, it looks, it looks quite nice in uh, in a wreath. Uh, here in this wreath, uh, again, uh, this was at the Joel Lane house, and you know, a ribbon again would not have been used uh, on a wreath um, at the Joel Lane house. But what I've taken here is uh, pampas grass, 
And here's where the gloves are a very important thing. I cut the pampas grass and tied it into a bow, uh, let it dry, and then tie that to the wreath. So again, you're given that illusion of a ribbon, but it is done with natural material. The gray berries that you see here are bayberry. The red berries are sumac. And all of these materials are natural materials that you can find on the roadside uh, and many of our yards and ditch banks and byways of, of North Carolina. Uh, just a word of caution, uh, make sure when you are gathering uh, materials like that, that you do have permission from landowners if it, has to, if it happens to be on um, uh, private property. And uh, another word uh, of caution, and I learned this from a, an herbalist in Western North Carolina, um, uh, who cautioned uh, all of her followers when she would take them out on journeys into the forest to gather herbs. And, and she said, when you first walk, if you're looking for a, a flower or an herb and you come to a spot where you see the herb or the flower, take notice of it and pass it by. And then when you're going through the forest and then you see the next, uh, same flower or that next same herb, take notice of it and also pass it by. And then when you come to the third uh, planting of that herb or that flower, then take and you can cut that and take that with you and gather it. Uh, because she said, if everybody cuts the first and the second uh, flower or herb, then nobody will go further into the woods and, and you may deplete um, that plant or that herb and, and cause it to be scarce. So that was a, a good word of advice that I always take is that I never take my first uh, cutting from the first sighting that I have. I always go two steps further and take cuttings um, from that from that plant. Uh, over to the right in this wreath, what I've done is taken a very large longleaf pine cone, and I have made that into a pineapple by taking again the um, the pampas grass and kind of creating the top that looks similar to a a pineapple. So again, taking materials and making it into something that really it wasn't um, uh, destined to be uh, in the first place. In this wreath, you will see uh, a wreath uh, that is with oyster shells. And this wreath I made for Haywood Hall. And I chose to use oyster shells in this wreath because Haywood Hall was known for having oyster roast during the Christmas season. So I thought it would be quite appropriate uh, to take some discarded oyster shells and uh, place those in the wreath. Uh, what I would do was, what I would do to attach the, the oyster shells is drill a hole through the oyster shell, uh, take a fake pearl. Uh, run the wire through the pearl and then take the wire and run it through the hole. So when you see the oyster shell, you see like this pearl that's in the midst of the oyster shell and then I'll wire that to the, the wreath. And again, I think that looks quite nice with all the other mixed berries and, and natural materials. On the right, you will see another wreath where I have taken the, uh, what we call broom straw that you'll see uh, on quite a few North Carolina ditch banks and byways. And I've taken that broom straw, attached that to the side of the wreath. And in the spirit of Mary Ellen, I took uh, a, a bird's nest 
and attach that to the wreath. And I actually fill the bird's nest with quail eggs that I received from a friend of mine who raises quails. And then I took the eggs and colored them to look like bluebirds eggs. So again, adapting and reusing uh, materials to create a, a natural uh, Christmas uh, arrangement. And this wreath, you will see, uh, again, the use of oyster shells, uh, rabbit tobacco, and millet. And the bow here was taken from the leaves of the millet plant. Uh, I wet the, I soaked the millet leaves in water, and then I shaped the millet leaves, and then wire the millet leaves together, and let it dry, and then attached it uh, to the wreath, as you will see here. And I did two different styles of ribbons uh, on the wreath, uh, and I also added uh, eucalyptus here, and again with sumac. Here I am uh, placing a wreath at the Joel Lang house. And uh, in this you will see a fir tree uh, where it had shedded its uh, greenery uh, and turned brown. So I use these discarded uh, brown um, sections of the greenery and attach that to a wreath. And if you look closely, uh, I used uh, a garland of the dreaded sweet gum balls that I strung together along with um, uh, acorns and other dried berries to create a garland and I wove that throughout the wreath. In this wreath, I again used the the broom straw, but I also included uh, gourds um, that you'll see attached in the wreath. Uh, and then again, another wreath where I used a variety of dried materials, raffia, the sumac, rabbit tobacco, and then the dried evergreen boughs and bayberry as well. And that is, that is it. Um, that is the end of my end of my presentation, and uh, I am open to questions. All right, Michael. So the first question is: someone's asking for tips on constructing a basic greenery wreath. Okay, what um, what I usually do. Um, I do, I do create, um, I do create um, my own wreaths at times. Uh, I will take a, usually I will start with a grapevine um, form. I will take the grapevine, wrap it around into a, uh, a tightly um, woven circle. And then I will take wire or twine, gather up bunches of greenery and just keep overlaying it uh, on the grapevine form. But oftentimes uh, I will just go and purchase from the farmer's market a, an already made wreath and then attach my, my additions to the wreath. Awesome. Um... How do you bring outdoor items like pine cones and feathers, et cetera, into the, um, to use as decor inside without bringing bugs with them? Okay. Usually, usually what I will do is um, a, a week or so uh, before I plan to, to use them in decorations, I will kind of place them in quarantine uh, underneath my garage. Uh, and so that way any bugs or insects uh, will usually uh, come out by that time. 
uh, and then right before I start using them in my decorations, I will make sure that that I shake them out really good and, and check them to see if there are any insects or any, or any loose um, flowers. Uh, I will point out that like with a rabbit tobacco, uh, if, you will, if you will break off the branches and um, um, you will need to take those and, and really quarantine those for a while, not only to, not only to, to get insects and bugs out, but also um, to rid them of the like fluff, the seed fluff um, that will that is dried in the branches. So if you will take a, a bundle of, of that rabbit tobacco and other flowers as well, even broom straw, you will take it and shake it vigorously in your hand as soon as you um, uh, cut it, you will see this white seed pod fluff that will float out. And that is definitely something that you don't want to put in your house um, or, or, or try to work with. So what I'll do, I'll shake the fluff out, uh, the seed pods out, and then I'll hang it upside down again underneath my garage and let all that fall out uh, so it can be ready to be placed inside the house. All right, what herbs have you found that dry best for fragrance as well as attractiveness? I, I use a lot of rosemary. Uh, I use a lot of sage in, in my arrangements. Um, and, and I've even uh, taken uh, bundles of, uh, of oregano and time as well, and, and bundle them up really tightly and, and place them as a bunch in, uh, the, in the wreath. Uh, one thing you can do uh, is make pomander balls. And, and pomander balls are, you can take oranges uh, or lemons uh, or limes, uh, and you take whole cloves, and you will, you will punch holes in the lemons or oranges. And, and then you will take the whole clove and stick into the hole of the, of the lemon or orange or lime uh, and cover, cover, the, cover the fruit uh, with the cloves. And then you can take a mixture of, of cinnamon, cloves and allspice and put the, the fruit uh, in the bag of the uh, ground up spices, roll it around so the juices uh, absorb and adhere to the fruit, um, take it out, put it in a, a plastic bag and, and let the, the scent cure and the fruit dry. And as the fruit dries, it absorbs the dried spices and the smell. And, and after about a couple of weeks or so, you can take that dried uh, fruit out and then place that in a wreath or place it in a bowl throughout your house. And, and that will last for, for many months to come. Um, as a follow-up to that question, someone's asking how long it usually takes to dry herbs for using. Well, I, I don't necessarily dry my herbs uh, before I use them in arrangements. A lot of times I will take my herbs when they are fresh and place them in the arrangements then. Um, but depending, if you wanted to dry your herbs, I mean, it can be a matter of, of a few days before herbs will, will dry, uh, especially if it's in, a, it's in an open area with a lot of breeze uh, and sun, uh, the herbs will dry pretty quickly. Um, someone asked for advice on how to decorate their home using the old and the new, like seamlessly, like without making it cluttered or tacky. <laughs> well, I think it's, you know, again, you, you know, you start, if you're, if you're working for, your home and 
you know, and if you're if you're trying to uh, appeal to maybe your home's era, um, you know, if your if your home is an 1850s home versus a 1950s home, uh, your style of decorating probably will will vary or differ. Um, so you can kind of decorate according to your period of your home, how it might have been decorated for the period. But if you do want to incorporate uh, other periods and other decorations and, and natural materials, um, for instance, you know you could have you could have an artificial greenery on your mantle, uh, but you could place uh, your fresh herbs or uh, your fresh cedar or your fresh pine right into the artificial greenery on top of your mantle. You could take your dried flowers uh, or your fruits and place that uh, uh, on your mantelpiece in with your artificial decoration. You could take, again, the same thing. You could take an artificial wreath and place uh, fresh greens in your wreath along with fresh fruits as well and dried flowers. So you really can kind of make a seamless um, mixture of, of old and new and fresh and artificial. And, you know, you could even take, you know, if you take, for instance, you could take your, your artificial Christmas wreath, place some fresh cedar in it, you could place a few red balls and then some some dried flowers and, and, and really just kind of play with it and uh, and see what works for you and, and what you like uh, and, and and what um, what excites you. And it's really about the mixture of um, of what excites you and what appeals to you. All right, and then I have a question for you. Um, what's your favorite historic place to decorate or that you have decorated and why? I would probably say my favorite uh, place that I've decorated is the Joel Lane House in Raleigh. Um, I love the time period of the house. It, it has a, a kitchen um, also on the property with the main house. And it, it offers me a variety and style of decorating. I can do a much more of a kind of like a gardeny type decoration to match the kitchen. But then I can also uh, do something more fanciful and maybe more decorative or more high style on the main house. Uh, so it really gives me a variety of, of ways to decorate. It also has the two front doors and the two back doors. So I can have one style of decorating on the front of the house, one style of decorating on the back of the house, and then also a style in the kitchen. So it really just gives me a way to explore many options for uh, portraying um, a natural Christmas. All right, and then someone's asking for your opinions about the old Salem decorations. About how they how they do it or what they're yeah he says any <laughs> any insights about it well all asylum is um uh they they usually don't take the approach that colonial williamsburg does um, they, they are not, um, uh, they don't, um, promote the use of, you know, the pineapples and, and fruits as much as, uh, colonial 
Williamsburg does. Old Salem uh, prefers to be more simple in their decorations and really uh, more in keeping with the, the simplicity of uh, the Moravian community. Um, so you'll see much more use of, of local um, greens and dried flowers uh, and uh, seed pods and pine cones and that sort of thing uh, versus what you will see in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and just a note on Colonial Williamsburg again, you know, Colonial Williamsburg learned early on um, that people wanted to see this type of, of decorating. Uh, they wanted to see this, this lavish decorating with fruit um, and flowers. And it became a hit. And, and they realized that, that people uh, might not pay to see you know, a pine cone in a wreath that's something that they could do themselves. So this, this Weirnsburg style of decoration really took on and really became uh, a phenomenon for them and, and became something to create a buzz for them and create a following, which in turn increased their visitorship and really created a whole different kind of, of Christmas atmosphere and holiday season. All right, I think that's all the questions that we have. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. And thank you, Michael, for giving us this behind the scenes look at the origin, origins of holiday decor. Um, I feel, I'm not a crafty person, but I feel so inspired <laughs> to go out and try to construct some of my own Christmas decor this year. Um, this has been a wonderful and fun way to kick off the holiday season. So thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you to all those of you who joined us today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it. And as we reminded a few, a few folks in the chat, um, all of our History and High Noons are recorded and posted to the museum's YouTube channel. So you can go there and check out a video of today's program if you were joining us late. Um, we hope that you'll join us for our next History at High Noon, Days of Rejoicing and Refreshment for Our Hearts, Moravian Christmas Tradition. Uh, happening on Wednesday, December 16th at noon with Joanna Metzger-Brown, Curator of Moravian Decorative Arts for Old Salem Museums and Gardens in Winston-Salem. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.